Thank you for joining us for the National Center for Rural Road Safety's January webinar, Pavement Friction for Safety. Uh, my name is Jamie Sullivan. I'm the director of the National Center for Rural Road Safety. We're going to go through a few webinar logistics for you. Um, thank you also to our co-hosts for today, the NL TAPA Safety Work Group. Today's webinar is going to be an hour and a half in duration. Closed captioning is available. It should be posted in the chat pod and has also been emailed out to those of you who have asked for access to it. Today's webinar will be recorded um, and be posted on our website within the week. So you can check out that website at ruralsafetycenter.org uh, slash webinar dash archive. Additionally, we're gonna stop twice today for questions. Our first speaker is going to have to leave uh, after she has done her presentation as she has another presentation directly following it today. So I would encourage you if you have questions, for, again, for our first speaker, please put those in the question pod um, as they come up for you and we will address those as soon as she is done speaking. Um, additionally, we'll stop after our second presenter as well to take questions. We, um, I believe we will be posting some handouts into a pod later um, for you to be able to download and we'll let you know when those are up there. Um, if we are unable to get them up right now, we will make sure to email them out to everyone who has registered for today's webinar after we finish today's webinar. At the end of today, you will also get a survey to complete. Um, please go ahead and do those for us. It really helps us to figure out what additional topics you'd like to hear from the National Center for Rural Road Safety. And we will be sending out certificates of completion for today's webinar. Again, those do take a few weeks for us to send out as we manually create and email those. Along with those certificates, if you are, um, if you are staff who needs to have a formal uh, CEU or professional development hour form, we do send those as well that you can fill out for Montana State University and send back in and submit to get those formal CEUs or PDHs for your license. Again, if that's not necessary, necessary for your license, you don't have to worry about that. The certificate of completion should cover you. We do have two presenters for today on pavement friction for safety. Our very first speaker is gonna be Laura Fay. She's the program manager for the Cold Climate Operations and Systems Research Group at the Western Transportation Institute at Montana State University. Laura holds a MS in Environmental Science and Health from the University of Nevada, Reno, and a BS in Earth Sciences from the University of California, Santa Cruz. She has over a decade of transportation-related research experience and a demonstrated publication record in the areas of winter maintenance operations and environmental issues related to maintenance operations and materials and low volume roads. Laura is an active member of the Transportation Research Board under the National Academy, serving as the committee chair for the Low Volume Roads Committee and as a committee member on the Winter Maintenance Committee. And we're very excited to have her be our first speaker. So we're gonna pull up her presentation now. All right, can you see the correct screen? Looks great. Wonderful. All right, thanks for the very kind and lengthy introduction. I always need to be better about shortening my bio. Um, but thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk about roadway friction and winter maintenance operations. This is work we've been doing for um, quite a few years now. Actually, we started doing uh, friction work well over a decade ago, but really got into some really interesting research projects um, kind of right before the COVID pandemic. Um, so I'll be talking about some of the work we've done over the last couple of years. Um, so just to make sure we're all on the same boat, let's see, there we go, okay. So we're talking about friction and that's the resistance that one surface or object encounters when moving over another. Um, so friction, you know, you rub your hands together and they get warm and that's caused by friction. But what we're talking about in the winter maintenance context is the tire from the vehicle on the road surface. And for winter operations, a higher friction value is good. Um, that means more traction. So as I go through this presentation, um, that's really what we're talking about is trying to quantify friction in the safety realm for winter operations. So when we talk about roadway friction, 
Um, these values can tell us many things. For example, roadway friction values can be used to assess the quality of pavements, which is typically how these values have been used, or how much pavements have degraded over time. While roadway friction values during winter months can tell us about how slippery the roads are, it can also provide information on roadway conditions, such as whether the road is wet, icy, or snowy. Roadway friction values can also tell us about how the road surface has been treated. For example, does the roadway have a high friction wearing course, like a chip seal on it? If so, then the baseline friction values are going to be higher in winter, regardless of what's on the surface. Similarly, if you're using a solid or a liquid de-icing product and that's been applied to the roadway, it would stand to reason that friction values should improve. A good example of this is the use of sand in winter maintenance operations. While sand's not a de-icer, it's a tool used to improve traction or increase friction on the road surface. Note that when sand is applied, it may not be observed by all the friction measurement tools, and I'll get into that in a little bit, um, but it would stand to reason that by adding sand to a icy surface, you would improve friction. So here's an example of some work that was done by other folks, and it's a really good representation of roadway friction versus the speed of a vehicle traveling, and then also under varying pavement surface conditions related to winter operations. So here we have on the upper part of the graph, a scale of zero to 0.9. Typically when we, when we talk about roadway friction and winter maintenance, we're talking about a scale of zero to one. And this can vary a little bit depending on the different tool that was used to measure it, or if this is a calculated or derived friction value but typically the range is from zero to one, one being great friction and um, zero being poor friction or slippery. So if we go to the figure, we see that a nice dry paved surface has very high friction values, anywhere from just below 0.8 up to ideally one. And then as the surface becomes wet, we see a decrease in friction values. And then we get into compact snow, and then we get into maybe a compact snow or ice scenario or a slushy snow scenario. So you can see how these different conditions affect the road surface. And this is a really good point um, if you want to use this figure or these slides to really talk with your agency about conditions that you typically see and what that friction value is. So if you are using friction data, um, what that might mean for decision making. So moving forward, um, here's an example of some friction values or bracketed friction values that are used by Colorado DOT. One of the projects we did um, was working with Colorado DOT, looking at all their different sources of friction data and how they can apply that in winter operations. So this was a figure that they already had, so we wanted to work with their existing guidelines. So for them, dry, good quality pavement conditions ranged from 0.8 to 1. A wet road may range from 0.6 to 0.8. Um, and as we all know, a wet road can be just as dangerous as a snowy road. So it's important to understand what that might look like. Um, again, as you get to slushy and icy spots, your friction is decreasing. And then when you get down to an icy scenario of, for example, 0.45 or lower, um, you're definitely going to have a dangerous road condition um, where it's going to be hard to stop the vehicle in a controlled fashion. So every agency that uses friction might have a different definition um, of different conditions, and that's because conditions vary across the U.S. and black ice might be your primary concern, and so you might want to just target that or you might have a full range of conditions like this, from wet roads to icy to snowy, that you're of concern. So now that we know kind of generally what roadway friction in winter maintenance looks like, um, let's talk about how it's measured. So the gold standard for measuring pavement condition um, or friction is using um, kind of a toe behind wheel. 
and this provides the highest quality data. These are typically used at airports. Um, they're very expensive. There are many different units out on the market. These are just images of a few that are out there that are used. These are typically not used by state DOTs because you do have to have a driver in the vehicle. They typically have to drive slower. Um, so it does present its own safety issue in terms of data collection. Um, but the quality of the data is very high. Now, with that being said, these are mostly designed to assess friction of the pavement surface, not in the winter maintenance context. There's actually only one unit that was specifically designed to provide friction during inclement weather conditions. Um, but a lot of the other units have been kind of used or tweaked to be used in that fashion. Um, again, some DOTs have these, but not many. So then we get into the other measurement techniques. So along a lot of interstate corridors and states are ARWA stations or road weather information stations. Here's a picture of one on the lower right. This is in Colorado, just as an example. And from these ARWA stations, they essentially collect meteorological data, but at the road surface. So 30 feet above the road down to the actual pavement itself is what we're talking about in terms of data collection. So one way to collect friction data is to have a sensor like this. And again, this is just one example. Um, the picture on the upper right is of a non-contact sensor that is fixed and mounted at the ARWA station and points at the road surface and collects data from about roughly a two square foot area. So it's typically pointing at the outside wheel path on the uh, lane closest to the ARWA station. And so it would collect data from that fixed point. Um, and because this is a non-contact sensor, whatever's on the surface of the road, that's what it's measuring. So it's not like the wheel, where the wheel is running over the pavement, um, over the slush, over the ice, and collecting at that tire pavement interface. This non-contact sensor is just looking at what is on the pavement surface but it can tell you friction, it can tell you surface conditions, so wet, icy, snowy, dry, um, air pavement and temperature of the pavement itself. So here is an example of what an ARWIS network might look like. This just happens to be Colorado because we did work with them. Um, all of the blue dots are ARWIS stations that have friction sensors. And you can see these little purple dots, if you look really close, say 0.82, and that's just the value of friction at the moment that um, the screenshot was grabbed. So again, there are many different um, sensors that are made by different companies out there that do this same thing. So another non-contact method to measure friction is a mobile sensor. Um, on the right-hand side here, I have two examples of mobile sensors made by different companies. Essentially, you mount them on the back of a vehicle or a snowplow, and they collect data from the road surface. And that data might look like this on the right-hand side, where you have a map overlaid with different colored um, blobs reporting different road conditions. This just happens to be what it looks like in MDSS, which is that State Pool Fund Maintenance Decision Support System tool. But on this next slide, I'm gonna show you um, from one of the units on the previous slide, the upper sensor is the Taconner sensor. Um, and this is what that data looks like. So they give you um, a screen display for each unit um, and what the data is showing real time. So you can make decisions based on what the road conditions look like. Um, real time with this data, which is interesting. And then you can click on this link actually, and you can view all over the world, all the uh, Taconner sensors that are out there, which is really interesting to do. So essentially there's the three methods to measure roadway friction that are used right now. I would say by far the stationary non-contact sensors are the most common on roadways. Um, and you know, there's pros and cons to all of them. Um, essentially, with the stationary ARWIS based sensors, um, you're getting a lot of data from a fixed point. So the data resolution is good um, for that one location, 
but extrapolating out can be a little hard and you do have to get into some um, modeling techniques like Krieging and things like that if you want to extrapolate that data out to the next ARWA site. Um, these can be moderately expensive depending on what um, units you're using and, and how many you want in your network. Um, the mobile sensors, um, they give you real-time data. It's mapped for you by these different vendors. Um, some of the cons are that, you know, it's only on the one vehicle it's mounted on. And if it's mounted on the supervisor's vehicle, um, you only have data for when they're out driving that vehicle. Um, or if it's mounted on the plow, you're only getting data when that plow is out. Um, but it is good real-time quality data. And it's also highly dependent on what lane and wheel path that vehicle is traveling in. Um, the contact sensors, so the, the wheel, the tow behind wheels, um, again, great quality data, but these are extremely more expensive than the other two options. Uh, I think the last time I asked about purchasing one of these for a research project, um, don't quote me, but I want to say it was close to $100,000 for one of these. So it, it's a significant cost, whereas one of the mobile sensors might be $6,000. Um, so that in itself can limit um, the amount of data you can collect. So moving forward, um, what can we do with all this? Can all these, um, can we assume that all this friction data is the same between these different measurement techniques? And um, there's actually been quite a bit of research recently on this. And the answer is, of course, fuzzy and gray and complicated, yes and no. Um, yes, generally speaking, if friction is good, it should be good for all the sensors. And if friction is bad, all the sensors and all the data should show that there is low friction. But where things get a little complicated is how, especially from the non-contact sensors, whether it's mobile or stationary, how they interpret, let's say below 0.4 to um, 0.1, friction values, so in the area where you're talking about snowy roads, icy roads, black ice, um, the sensors might report something different. They might report different conditions, and that's for a variety of reasons. It might be the model that's used within it to determine the different conditions. Um, it might be uh, where the sensor is actually pointing. Um, so here is a good example of what commonly happens. So if you have a stationary ARWA sensor and it is looking at the right-hand side of the road in one of these bare wheel paths, it's going to give you a, a, a value that shows either a wet pavement or maybe a slightly icy pavement. But if that ARWA sensor was pointed instead at the other side of the road, it would report a packed snow scenario. So the variability of the road condition itself can really influence these values. Um, and the same goes for the mobile sensors. Um, if the mobile sensor is driving down the right-hand side of the road, the values are gonna be significantly different than if it's traveling down the left-hand side. Um, so accommodating that variability in the results is, is very challenging. And sometimes what you need for that are actually camera images, which folks are just now starting to try to fold in. So another piece of this, so I don't want this to be all doom and gloom, but um, another really important piece of using these friction sensors is maintenance and calibration. And it was, this was brought to us um, working with the state agencies and that you really need, if you have mobile or stationary sensors, you need to have a maintenance and calibration plan in place for these. Um, for the stationary RWS based sensors, you would do like an annual maintenance where you go to the ARWA site, you check every sensor, you wipe the lens, you make sure everything is running appropriately. And then there might even be a calibration protocol that you follow. For the mobile sensors, it varies highly for every sensor. Um, for one, you have to, for every time you drive the vehicle with a mobile sensor, you have to calibrate it, you have to wipe the lens. And so that's an extra level of effort that not everybody is willing to do or follow through with. And so you don't necessarily, you can't trust the data all the time. Whereas for another mobile sensor, you don't need to do that every time. So um, 
in terms of which sensor you choose, it may come down to ease of use and consistency of data, um, just based on you know, how you think your folks are gonna operate with these types of sensors. So knowing all of this, how do we use this data? Well, you can use it for planning. Um, for example, most people have, not most, all agencies have level of service guidelines or LOS guidelines. And those are gonna tell you what needs to be done in what amount of time or to bring vehicles back up to a speed. Um, and you need to have guidelines to help frame that for the highway, for the interstates, for the local roads. And so one way that you can generally bracket this friction data is shown below. And that's above 0.6 is typically considered fairly safe. It's 0.6 to 0.4, that might be a, a wet condition or where you're beginning to see snow on the road. And that's gonna be your flag of like, we need to start paying attention. Do we need to go out? What are our air temperatures and pavement temperatures telling us? Do we need to get operations going? Um, and then below 0.4, that's really where road condition is not great and you're gonna to have to be actively treating it. So you can use these guidelines. What's interesting is that these, these values are what folks in the US are comfortable using. In Europe, they actually start flagging roads or looking at them at 0.45 and below. Um, and then the red or danger zone in Europe is actually 0.25 and below. So it's really, um, the scale is based on our own comfort level, and so every agency might be a little different, but these values are typically in the US what's agreed upon for use. So for real-time decision-making, again, you can use these friction values. You can go into your RWIS network, you can look at your RWIS camera images here, um, especially if you get one friction sensor from an RWIS station that's showing in that red zone, you can pull up the camera image and you can be like, oh yeah, this RWIS site is on a bridge. Um, it's showing that it's icy now. We need to go out and hit that. Um, or on the contrary, you might be able to look at your RWIS data um, and that friction value is actually climbing up. It's getting a little better. So you can start pulling back resources and shifting them to another location. Um, so again, this data can be used planning real time or for example, as an after action review or a post storm review. So what this shows here is an example of two different friction data sources. The blue data is the stationary RWIS friction data, and the red data is the mobile data. And these are from the exact same location. This was a storm in Colorado in um, the Halloween weekend in 2019. So um, what we're looking at here are those black arrow bars at the bottom. And so we can go back and say, okay, how long was friction below 0.6? And then how long was it below 0.45? How long did it take us to recover? And what operations did we use within that time frame to recover? Can improvements be made? Um, so this is just a tool that can be used um, or an application of the data. Um, which can be a really interesting piece, um, especially as you get further down the road in terms of using friction data for these real-time operations. So as always, there's always folks that are kind of pushing the edge and um, using new data, new technologies. Um, one state DOT that has really gone all in and incorporated friction in their operations is Idaho. Um, they have been actively using friction as a um, management tool piece. Um, they determine um, basically their level of service and the quality of service in part based on their friction values. And they're incorporating that into their um, online um, assessment tool right now. And um, it's pretty neat to see how they were able to take a, this data point and fold it into all the other data they're collecting. So cost, person hours, amount of salt on the road, and they're using friction in that analysis as well. Um, ongoing research right now, um, we're working with Clear Roads and we're looking at friction data from different states and different um, data collection methods of friction and how those friction values relate to salt applications. Um, so that project should wrap in the fall of this year. 
Um, so you can expect those results. Another really interesting project out of Massachusetts DOT um, and UMass Amherst is they're using um, spreader controller data. So that's actually measuring the amount of de-icer that the truck is putting out real time. And they're linking that with mobile ARWA, so those mobile sensors, including friction data, so they can tailor application rates real time um, to what actual road conditions are. And I think they're actually just piloting this winter, I think, with their first um, test of this with two trucks, which um, I'm really excited to see the results on that. And then another project that's ongoing that's um, still in the early phases, but in Iowa, the DOT is working with Iowa State University and they've um, purchased data from vehicles in the state of Iowa and they're, they're doing some processing of what we call floating car data. And um, right now they're doing big picture assessments of can they use this data? Do they have enough data resolution? Um, I think next steps, they were talking about doing some safety analysis. And ultimately, I know that they would like to incorporate some of this into winter operations um, and analyzing some of that. So again, that's another really interesting um, upcoming application of this. But what we can say for sure is that friction data that's being collected is being used to optimize resources, measure performance, efficiently and effectively treat roadways, and in the future will hopefully be used to help automate operations. Um, and then as kind of a side note, you know, these friction sensors do cost additional money. They're not a part of a standard ROS setup. So if you have a situation where you have a few friction sensors, but you can't afford a full deployment, a project that um, NCAR just wrapped up, we worked with them on this. Um, we use data from multiple states and even from other countries. And um, essentially what they found was that using machine learning and two seasons of winter data, if you have friction data and other ARWIS data sources, you can actually model roadway friction very accurately. Um, if you have air temperature, road surface temp, dew point temp, relative humidity, water thickness, snow thickness, and road state. Um, so that's really good news for folks that can't afford for wide-scale deployment of these friction sensors, but instead can do a more localized deployment in key areas and then could model out for the rest of the state. Um, but it is really important that the data be from your area. Um, we did try to take uh, models from um, developed in other areas and apply them and the accuracy was not as high. So, um, but that is a great option for folks if they do not um, have a ton of friction sensors. So here are links to the Colorado project and then that um, roadway modeling project I was just talking about. You can access these from the um, CDOT and Aurora web pages. And then with that, I will take any questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Laura. We did have one question, which I answered, and hopefully everyone was able to see that. Um, we kept talking about ARWIS, and that stands for Road Weather Information Systems, and that was one of those um, pictures at the front that Laura had showed, um, as well as some of the cameras that she showed pictures of as well. I think she's going to go back to what those look oh. like. And then we have, yeah, and then we have a couple other questions for you as well. Perfect, yes. So this is a picture of an ARWIS or a road weather information system. Um, the next question that came in for you, Laura, is for planning, can we use the friction number to identify pavement surface needed treatment? So um, I think Kelvin's gonna talk about that. I think um, in the context of winter operations, I think in an ideal world, you would have that data set where you have all of your roads and your current roadway friction measured in ideal situations. So in summer, you go out and you, you measure that. And then that way, when you go out in winter and you measure roadway friction, you, you can get a relative road fr friction result um, because a bad pavement in summer is still gonna be a bad pavement in winter. It's just gonna also maybe have snow and ice on it. So um, 
Yes, you can with the friction wheel, which is this one. But those non-contact sensors, those are not going to be the right devices for you to use to measure uh, roadway condition um, in summer. Um, in fact, those, uh, so the non-contact sensors like the RWIS-based ones or the mobile ones, these are not able to detect, for example, if you put sand on the road and you have technically improved friction, they're not going to see that. Um, they might see that you put a, a rock salt down and that that snow and ice is melting. Um, but yeah, so yes, you can measure it, um, but not with the non-contact sensors I talked about. We do have a couple of other questions about the links and the slides. Um, when we do move on to our next presenter, I will post all of those links that she had in her PowerPoint um, in the chat pod. We are also working, as I mentioned at the beginning, to get the handouts of the slides um, into the, the handout pod too. And again, if we cannot do that by the end of this webinar, we will email them to everybody who's attending. Um, so you'll have those. Um, however, it, I just did a quick look through the PowerPoint that I have, Laura, and someone is looking for the Idaho's road friction strategy or report. Was that one of the links in here or is that something that you can share with us after you're done? Um, it was not in the presentation, but I will share it with you so you can send it. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, and the last question that came in for you is, did you say the stationary recording unit was $100,000? If so, are there grants available to help with the cost? So the, um, the toe behind wheel units are the expensive ones. Um, and again, these are the gold standard in terms of the quality of data you're going to get. Um, these are the $100,000 range um, units, and they, the cost of them, the, there is a range with these as well, so there might be a cheaper option, but from the folks I've spoken to at airports and whatnot, you do want to go with um, the better performing models so that you have trust in the quality of the data and that they do function appropriately. Um, in terms of getting grants for these, I'm not sure you could, I'm sure there might be like stick funding or um, something like that, that an agency could use. Um, you know, I'm a big proponent of calling the company and saying, hey, can you bring one out and we can do a test run and see how it works in your area. Um, and then if you like it, figure out a way, whether it's a grant or something. Um, but most, let's see, I'm trying to think, I know that in the past, MnDOT had one and they were having trouble, not with the unit itself, but it, because you have to drive slow on a highway environment, you know, there is a safety issue with that. They ended up, um, I think they sold it or gave it to a, a local agency to use. Um, I'm sure they sold it given the cost, but yeah, I, I would look around for different grant options. Um, and, you know, the vendors themselves might know of a few grant options to help pay for some of this. We did actually have two more questions come in while you were just answering that one. The next one is, have you used Geomat with mill and resurfacing? I have not, but I think that would be a really great use of this data is if you could have that mapped out and then put the winter conditions on top of that. I think that would give you a really accurate image of what you're truly seeing in winter, because if your highest pavement friction value starts at a 0.7, um, because of the surface condition, that's gonna affect your winter maintenance of that area um, because things are gonna get slippery a lot quicker. So I think that would be a really great application, but I personally have not done that. Um, and the next question is, after a while, many roads require maintenance. Are the stationary units able to determine if rutting occurs by tracking the height of the vehicles? No. <laughs> um, that is not in their intended design purpose, but rutting is a problem as, as we all know. So I think, I think what I'm talking about in the winter maintenance context clearly needs to be paired with the summer pavement condition assessment that looks at the quality of the pavement, cracking, rutting, and all of that. And I, I do think that Kelvin's talk next will talk through hopefully some of that road condition assessment um, 
that can then be folded into using this data in winter operations. Perfect. Um, so not a question, but a statement from someone who asked a question. They said that Geomat adds to the life of the resurfacing by up to seven years, just for everyone's information. Um, Laura, I want to thank you for taking time today to come and present. Um, I know that you have to leave us to get to another presentation. So again, thank you. Um, and for everyone listening, the handout for Laura's presentation has been posted now in the handout pod. Um, and as our next speaker um, comes on, I will make sure that I add those uh, links also to the chat pod for everyone as well. So our next presenter is going to be Kelvin Wang. He is the new director of the Western Transportation Institute and a professor in the Department of Civil Engineering at Montana State University, Bozeman. He is a past Regents Professor and Dawson Chair of Civil Engineering at the Oklahoma State University with decades of experience in transportation and civil engineering. He was a highway engineer for the Arizona Department of Transportation for four years and a professor at the University of Arkansas for 18. Between 2011 and 2023, he was an endowed professor at Oklahoma State. In 2017, he received the prestigious Francis C. Turner Award from the American Society of Civil Engineers. It was named a distinguished member of ASCE in 2021. He is known for his technological achievements in 3D laser imaging and associated artificial intelligence solutions for highway and airfield pavement surveys and bridge evaluations and he was formerly the president of ASCE's Transportation and Development Institute. And we're excited to have him on here today to follow up with Laura's presentation to talk to us about 3D laser imaging. Kelvin? Kelvin, you're muted. Kelvin, if you can see yourself uh, in the attendee list or in the staff list, uh, there's a microphone. If you can unmute there, I'm not able to do it on my end. You're self-muted. While we're trying to get Kelvin's um, audio working, if anyone has any experience that they've used with some of the technologies that Laura was talking about or um, with some of the, the questions that were just answered of Laura, you can feel free to put those into the Q&A pod. I'd be happy to share some of those with the rest of the audience as well and read those out. And then, Kelvin, a reminder that we can see your screen, but we cannot hear you. Oh, it looks like you're unmuted now. Try again. Okay. Uh, well, Perfect. I apologize for the uh, hiccup here. Uh, thanks, Jamie, for the uh, invitation. And also, uh, I'm so happy uh, that uh, Laura's presentation uh, was really an introduction to what I'm going to talk about. So uh, that's a, a fantastic arrangement. Uh, uh, the other thing I, I'm uh, pleasantly surprised is uh, we have uh, well over 200 uh, attendees, and uh, so I'm I'm really happy that uh, the National Center for Rural Safety has uh, uh, really outreached uh, to the community, and uh, it's very very important for us. Anyhow, uh, welcome to uh, this webinar, and welcome to uh, Western Transportation Institute. I'm. Uh, 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 the director for half a year now, and uh, we're making a lot of progress with the support of a lot of senior staff, including Jamie and uh, Laura and others. Anyhow, so I'm going to uh, change the gear a little bit, uh, talking about payment friction for safety. 
uh, using non-contact based uh, uh, 3D laser imaging. Uh, Jamie kind of alerted me earlier that the audience uh, is largely uh, practitioners. Uh, so that gave me uh, some uh, uh, good information on how I present uh, this technology-based uh, presentation. Many of you probably knew that uh, uh, myself and my team have been doing uh, automated payment distress survey for about 30 years now. Uh, we started off with uh, uh, the first uh, digital system in the world in the late 90s. And now we, uh, after several generations of our development, uh, we have this uh, half a millimeter 3D system, uh, we call it PAVE 3D 8K, that can cover the pavement surface uh, 13 and a half feet uh, at half millimeter resolu resolution, essentially is an 8K resolution, 8,000 pixels across the lane. And we can collect this resolution data at highway speed. Okay, we uh, achieved this goal about uh, four or five years ago. So uh, that's, a, that's a fantastic work uh, by my team. And uh, it's, a it's literally a 30 year commitment for us uh, to uh, advance this technology, uh, which is used uh, in several countries, including the US for sure. And uh, we also uh, developed the uh, CrackNet AI-based uh, software solution, uh, which is very, very important for our uh, technology development and also for our payment distress survey as a whole. Uh, this paper at the bottom of the screen that we published in 2017 uh, has been cited uh, over 800 times. Uh, uh, so. Uh, it's a, it's a record for us, for my team. Uh, you may uh, know that uh, for any civil engineering papers, uh, if they uh, were cited over 100 times through the lifetime of the paper, uh, it's, a, it's a highly cited paper. So we are at 800 today. Uh, before I act, actually talk about how we do the uh, payment surface imaging for friction, for safety evaluation, I'm going to uh, spend uh, a, a few minutes on uh, neural net. What is a neural net? What is deep learning? And how we can explore this technology uh, for our benefit, for payment engineers benefit, for safety engineers benefit. Uh, artificial neural network came out of a uh, uh, PC era. So roughly 30, 40 years ago, uh, people started playing this concept in a computer. Uh, at that time, it was uh, 386, 486, and then Pentium. Uh, for people who are uh, about my age or a little bit younger than I am, would remember uh, using those computers at that time. So uh, uh, people were using 16-bit operating system and 32-bit uh, operating system at that time. Uh, it was pretty hard to do. I actually, as a young researcher, 30 years ago, I played around a uh, neural net in a computer myself. It's fascinating capability, but it uh, was not able to solve any practical problems. Uh, and uh, that's why it kind of uh, stayed in the closet for, <laughs> for about 10, 20 years until uh, roughly 10 years ago, people became uh, aware that computing power was powerful enough to uh, explore the capability of artificial neural net to solve uh, actual problems. So essentially uh, the idea uh, came out way before four decades ago. I suspect is maybe uh, during World War One, World War II era, some uh, biologists and uh, scientists uh, would you know, came up with an idea that, uh, you know, they understood the neurons then uh, in human brains. And they said, if we model it uh, artificially through some kind of computing device, maybe we can have uh, artificial neurons. Uh, and then of course, nothing happened until the era of computing uh, that uh, became affordable. So uh, initially they started with uh, thousands of neurons and then millions. 
and uh, today we are in billions of neurons. Essentially, they build the neurons to form a network. So a lot of people call a uh, deep learning model, uh, instead of model, they call it a network. Actually, it is a network, as you can see. Uh, and then the weights connecting the neurons uh, represent the very, very small electricity going on among the neurons of a human brain. So the bottom line of uh, doing training of our neural network is to determine the weights connecting all the neurons, okay? So this is like one sentence describing the essence of uh, uh, deep learning. That is essentially you build a lot of neurons, uh, billions of them today, and then you connect all the neurons uh, through weights. And how to determine the weights is the process of learning. So, uh, uh, so this this process is very critical. Uh, that's why uh, those big tech firms they are using uh, uh, thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of GPU cards uh, to conduct the weight determination of the billions of neurons connections. So, uh, so it's a very uh, tremendous task. It's very energy uh, driven uh, because, you know, we have uh, hundreds or thousands of uh, GPU cards and each card takes several hundred watts and then you can compute how many watts uh, would be needed just to drive uh, a single uh, compute, computer network to do the training of determining billions of weights connecting the neurons. So why deep learning? Uh, deep learning has uh, interesting properties. Uh, it's very versatile and uh, it's uh, very reliable and it's, it's accumulative. Uh, for those that uh, played uh, with math models in high school and of course uh, college level calculus, you know that once one model is built mathematically, that model is done. You really cannot say this model, I can, I'm going to add more knowledge into that model. The model is going to learn by itself. Uh, but the deep learning has a unique property uh, that you actually can learn uh, as you have more samples. Uh, it's almost like a human being. When a kid goes to uh, grade school uh, and uh, middle school, uh, high school, uh, college, uh, generally speaking, uh, all the information or knowledge gained through those years from uh, kindergarten and up, uh, they, they are cumulative. And then deep learning has this very wonderful uh, property. So uh, uh, before I finish, I want to talk about uh, the deep learnings of uh, basic properties. So it's, uh, it's big, right? So billions of neurons. Sometimes uh, you can talk about chat GPT. I think they really talk about 10 billions of neurons and how to determine the billions and billions of weights connecting the neurons, right? So, uh, so it's very big. Uh, but the other thing is for those people who uh, had the computing knowledge, you would know that the 32-bit uh, IEEE uh, precision standard, right? So people are talking about 32-bit uh, precision and it's high precision. We can do very uh, high level math, uh, for example, dynamics and uh, simulation and uh, many other things uh, or atomic, atomic bomb simulation. They require high precision math. Uh, interestingly, uh, connecting weights uh, between uh, layers of neurons uh, does not require high resolution. Uh, so that's a very good property. So we are actually going to 8-bit or less. We know 8-bit only has uh, 256 variations, right? Uh, the reason being uh, is the electricity going through the actual neurons in human brains is very low voltage, very low level, and the variations are also very limited. Uh, people actually uh, were able to determine that. So this computer scientist says, hey, you know, if we use high precision, we would require a lot more computing power. So we degrade our precision to 8-bit, 7-bit, 6-bit, maybe even 4-bit. And then we can uh, quantum leap our computing power by using uh, less precision uh, variables. And that's exactly what's happening. So the GPUs are perfect for, for doing that. That's why uh, 
you know, uh, the most powerful GPUs, uh, excuse me, most powerful neural network today is the chat GPT-4. And uh, you use literally probably a million GPUs, very high powered GPUs uh, to do this uh, computation. And the other thing that you guys may want to know is uh, deep learning has its a buzzword. Uh, it can be fancy, but generally speaking, it uses huge ma matrix operations and is very sparse. Uh, so it's a sparse and very big matrix. It can be a, like a billion or 10 billion uh, elements in the matrix, but the vast majority of the elements in the matrices are zeros. Uh, so that uh, also gave a lot of uh, computational advantage to speed up the processing. So uh, application of deep learning, cognition based, right? That's very important. What is the cognition? For example, well, one year old child would recognize parents, particularly mother <laughs> and siblings. Uh, a father probably is the last, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, there's no other reason but by cognition, the brain develops and uh, you know affection and everything else. Uh, as person a person grows and then the cognition develops along with formal training. Okay, so deep learning can do that. There's a very powerful uh, property. Okay, now I spend a few minutes talking about uh, uh, some real basic concepts in deep learning. Uh, why it is important for our safety or friction work. About five years ago, uh, my team and myself look at the uh, friction data collection. Laura did a fantastic introduction in her presentation regarding contact-based. Uh, essentially, you have a wheel, uh, then you drag the wheel uh, on a payment surface. You measure the dragging force, uh, so the relationship of the weight of the wheel and the dragon force becomes our uh, friction number, right? So the friction number is generally less than one. Uh, one is the perfect friction, the best friction, and anything between one and six, a point six, uh, will be called a good uh, surface for friction. Uh, so that's all good. Now, the there's a huge problem with current contact-based friction testers. That is the repeatability and accuracy are not there. Even though we know that, you know, the the best devices we can measure friction today will be contact-based. Uh, but even that, for example, if you use the same contact-based friction tester on a payment, uh, you run multiple runs, uh, the variations can be very big. And also, if we use uh, a physics device to measure the actual friction, the true friction, uh, the accuracy is really not there. So because the reason being is the tire property uh, changes, right? It's an ASTM tire, we understand that, uh, but the wear, each tire can only be used for like two or 300 miles. After that, you have to change the tire because the wear would really uh, make the data not reliable or repeatable. And then you have to use water, right? On the friction testers, you have to use water underneath the tire to simulate uh, a raining condition. Uh, the uh, water film thickness uh, cannot be uh, correctly controlled. There's a variation there. And then the temperature, moisture, all those factors affect the tire pressure. Uh, so all those variables really not cannot be controlled, resulting in the problems I just mentioned, repeatability and accuracy. So uh, about five, six years ago, uh, my team came up with an idea. Why do not we use the same 3D laser imaging principle, but scale the optics to a narrow area so that we can capture the payment surface con uh, uh, detail uh, at a micro uh, texture level. So we, we know that there's a macro texture, which starts at half a millimeter and up and the micro texture starts at half a millimeter and below. Uh, the micro texture and the macro texture information together can tell the complete story of payment friction property. So that's what we designed this sensor for. And uh, this is actually the sensor that's uh, in the lab that's fully really functional. Uh, as you can see, there's a line on the payment is uh, uh, the blue line there uh, is by accident. Uh, our university's uh, color is blue, <laughs> uh, but uh, 
uh, the blue line is a laser line. It's almost like a chalk line, but it's not. Uh, it looks like 10 times wider than it actually is. We call that a breeding uh, property of a very strong laser. So the laser line thickness is roughly at uh, 0.1 millimeter by itself, but it's very, very bright. So uh, that's the example. Uh, those are the examples of the pavement surface image we're going to produce. Uh, they're about roughly eight inches by eight inches, and you can see the details uh, at a definitely deep sub millimeter. Uh, there's another surface, as you can see, we capture this uh, uh, surface uh, on the parking lot, and uh, there's a decayed leaf uh, we're able to capture both in 3D and in 2D. And I'm going to sh just show you some visuals of the data quality we're able to capture at 0.1 millimeter. As I mentioned earlier, 0.1 millimeter uh, resolution covers the entire spectrum of uh, macro texture and the large uh, spectrum of the micro uh, texture as well. Uh, These are uh, the examples from uh, concrete payment surfaces. Okay. Now, uh, this, uh, now we come to the highlight of the presentation, that is how, uh, how you can get this kind of fine resolution at 0.1 millimeter at highway speed. Uh, there's a technical uh, limitation on the electronic sensors or the cameras itself. When you drive at 60 miles an hour, uh, we need uh, a camera that can do uh, uh, like 300,000 lines per second. Uh, we do not have a, a device that can do that, which means when we drive on the highway, we capture roughly eight inches wide of pavement. The width is 0.1 millimeter in resolution in 3D. But longitudinally, we are not able to get 0.1 millimeter uh, just because of the limitation of the camera, which cannot fire at uh, 300,000 times a second. So uh, we actually can do about 10% of that, which is not adequate. <clears throat> so how, um, how do we reconstruct the payment surface so that longitudinally we also can get uh, data resolution, as you can see on the screen, a, a true 0.1 millimeter in all three directions? I'm not going to go through all the details of the techniques. But I can tell you that what we are doing is essentially using deep learning techniques, okay? The approach is like this. We drive very slow on the pavement, very slow, like uh, a mile, an hour, or half mile an hour speed. So it's a crawling speed. Uh, and then we get the very high resolution longitudinally versus transversely, so same resolution, 0.1 millimeter. So we find many sections like that, okay? And then we drive at highway speed, like 60 miles an hour on the same sections of roads. So we have the ground truth, which is a true 0.1 millimeter in all directions. And then we have the high speed data. Transversely, we still have the 0.1 millimeter in all three directions. But longitudinally, no. Longitudinally, we get maybe one millimeter or several millimeter resolution, which is not good enough. So now we have two sets of data on the same section, so payments. Then we essentially engage a learning process by, develop, by developing a deep learning network. Essentially, we tell the brain, the computer brain, saying that, hey, this is the true resolution data, but collected at very, very low speed. And this is the final data that's collected at highway speed. They're the same thing. Can you learn that they're the same thing? So we do the training. And at the end of the day, after the training, when they say, OK, the training is finished, there are, there are metrics, metrics to measure the successful training. And we finish that. And then we drive at highway speed on a brand new pavement. And then we ask the deep learning network to reconstruct the data from the new payment into 0.1 millimeter resolution, both longitudinally and transversely. So as you can see from this one, we have a ground truth here on the right, 
that is collected at the very, very slow speed, the actual resolution, uh, this one probably is way less than inch by inch. I'm just, uh, we picked up a very small sample uh, from our data set. And then we decreased resolution by a factor of 64, okay? And then reconstruct the surface, essentially coming out of a high speed. Uh, so after 64 times increase of the resolution longitudinally, that direction, as you can see, it is very close, okay? So we had very good successes. And then this is on a concrete pavement, we did the same thing. We in, in essentially increased resolution in the longitudinal direction by a factor of 64. So essentially, you know, if it's 64 miles an hour versus one mile an hour, we're able to restore the resolution of the pavement, of a new pavement into a very high quality 0.1 millimeter resolution in both transverse and longitudinal directions. So uh, we did some comparisons, uh, MPD and MTD, those are ASTM standards for macro texture. As you can see that the correlations were wonderful. We, uh, our square values were way up there, uh, 0.9 and plus. Uh, in one example, it's uh, close to 0.9. And we also used the energy our wavelet energy for micro texture, and then we achieved a substantial correlation uh, way above uh, 0.9 uh, R square. And uh, we also worked with uh, a payment of friction prediction uh, using the dynamic friction tester with a static device. Uh, we used the neural net model on the right, as you can see, we approached uh, 0.85 R square value. So, uh, this comes to uh, the conclusion of this presentation, and uh, uh, deep learning is used in many applications today from consumer devices, consumer information systems, uh, to uh, many, many engineering disciplines. Uh, in payment engineering, it is very powerful. It, uh, it just uh, uh, outranks traditional methods uh, by a huge margin. And uh, so, uh, in the future, I believe for payment safety, payment design, payment management, payment distress survey, uh, we are going to embrace AI in a big way. Uh, you, every five years, you are going to see a big leap. Uh, so in 10 years from now, I can assure you uh, for payment engineers uh, who do safety, transportation engineers who do safety, uh, we will have a lot of tool sets uh, at our disposal, uh, uh, just uh, you know, AI-based. And the cognition capability uh, is real, uh, is usable today, and we're going to see more powerful tool sets uh, come uh, to us in the next few years. So, uh, Jamie, do I have uh, time for uh, our questions? You do. Yeah, we have some time and we do actually have some questions. So just a reminder to everyone to go ahead and put any questions you may have in the chat or in the Q&A pod. Um, additionally, I do wanna bring your attention to the chat pod. There was a question asked of the audience. Um, and so I'm gonna read that out now. And then if you're gonna reply as, a, as an answer to this question, um, please just indicate that when you do it so that we know that we should read it out as an answer to this question. But um, so our question for the audience is, has anyone used friction sensors for winter maintenance on a regional level? So for example, multiple partner agencies working together on the same platform to create a clear picture of winter road conditions during a, a snow event. Um, so again, if you wanna put that an answer into the question pod, just let me know that that is the answer to that question. And now, um, Kelvin, for you, a question that we have is, what is the optimal DPI resolution? Uh, the, uh, uh, the optimal resolution for the sensor system, uh, the, the higher, the better, right? Uh, I actually encountered a question way back uh, when we started doing this. Uh, one uh, very experienced uh, payment safety engineer asked uh, uh, that 0.1 millimeter resolution actually is not, uh, Good enough. I agree with that person actually. So uh, we're going to try to get uh, 0.05, uh, 
once our new lab uh, is set up at WTI, <laughs> just let you guys know that uh, we are going to use a lot of resources to uh, uh, establish a new lab, uh, 3D laser imaging and AI. Uh, so we're going to go to uh, point zero 0.05. I think when we reach point zero 0.05 resolution, uh, we will be uh, we will be done uh, with uh, developing. Uh, essentially a digital twin of the payment surface uh, in a narrow area, like a few inches wide. Uh, we cannot do uh, uh, 13 and a half feet uh, for the next few years, but we can we can do 0 0.05 resolution. Yeah, that will be 90% of the micro texture information will be there. Another question that came in for you, Kelvin, is does this also read the IRI smoothness? The IRI um, measurement can be conducted with the 3D sensor system. Okay, the I, the the IRI is defined in the 80s and 90s. Now we it took about three or four decades to refine that process. It's a very mature method to uh, measure payment roughness. Uh, the inertial based system that almost everybody uses it today for production. Uh, at high speed, it, it uses two sensors. One is the height sensor, one is the accelerometer uh, to measure the bouncing in the vertical direction. Okay, so the 3D sensor we have today, either the one for full length coverage or the one for several inches coverage, the safety sensor, they they measure the same thing. That's the height information. So we we are able to measure the height information, which is the side product from our sensor. Then we uh, added uh, an accelerometer to do to the same sensor. Uh, we actually are able to produce class one ASTM class one IRI information. Okay, so yes, so uh, we do have that capability. Uh, this next question is two parts. I'll do the first one and then come back with the second. The first part is: Is the laser imaging device for sale, or will it be soon? The uh, the, the full length coverage is being commercialized. It is used uh, by the FAA Tech Center in Atlantic City, is used by US Army Corps of Engineers in uh, Vicksburg, Mississippi. Uh, we have several private users in the US and uh, several users internationally. Uh, we The operation of this technology development is always university-based. So I'm glad you asked this question. So uh, let me know if you have any further interest. We do have a university-based uh, commercial operation that's uh, uh, that's not here yet. It's uh, it was based out of uh, Oklahoma, where I worked for 12 years. Uh, yeah. So uh, the safety sensor uh, is being commercialized. <laughs> so we have a lot of more work to do. Uh, yeah, you you some of you probably guessed why right? the the biggest challenge to use the 0.1 millimeter safety sensor in production is a ASTM standard. So we have several standards for contact and tire and water-based friction testers. Uh, those are the gold standards as uh, uh, Laura uh, introduced uh, in her presentation. Uh, they are widely used, they are very expensive, they start about 100K to maybe a uh, million dollars. Uh, if you're talking about the, uh, you know, the side measurement device, uh, that's uh, a million dollar device. It's a, it's a full size truck. Uh, so they are very expensive. They have limitations, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, so the non-contact 3D imaging based system uh, has much better potential in all aspects of uh, technical aspects, okay? But I, I believe Ashto, ASTM, those standard organizations need to come around, say, hey, this is the future. Uh, we need to start working on some standards. You know, without a standard, it's very difficult to ask field engineers to use the non-contact sensors. Uh, there are some brave people. <laughs> I, I met a lot of people who, uh, who supported my work uh, at the DOT level, and uh, they still do today. But uh, generally, as a community, we need to have standards. Mm -hmm. 
The next question for you is, how is data storage of so many high resolution images managed? It seems like this data over many years for a network will be so big and require massive investment in infrastructure to store for audits. Oh, the data storage. Uh, yeah, this is a, this was a challenge for years and years, uh, up to about five, five years ago, maybe 10 years ago. This data storage issue really, technically speaking, is no longer a concern today. Uh, the, I agree with you. Uh, the, when you archive uh, terabytes and terabytes of data uh, for the 3D information, um, how do you use the data? How can the data be subject to uh, auditing? And how you make the data uh, consistent so that, that they are comparable? Uh, those are all challenges. Uh, that's why uh, no matter how technology progresses, uh, research, uh, validation, certification, and training, they're all needed uh, in the future. I mentioned earlier that in the next five, 10 years, there will be so many more uh, high quality, very powerful tool sets we can use, but new problems will pop up like this. You know, you have tremendous amount of data uh, and they are very costly. Are you able to use the data sets? There's also a talk about how to use a large language models uh, at the DOT level so that you focus your large language model on transportation engineering aspects, right? So even for that, we have literally several hundred applications, if not more. How to you know build a small farm or GPUs to digest those terabytes and terabytes of data, not just on payments, but all aspects of engineering in a state DOT. Then you ask questions, and then hopefully the large language model would give you good answers. And uh, and sometimes they do a uh, hallucination, right? You guys heard about that. Uh, even ChatGPT4 can give you completely wrong answers. It's like this guy must be making things up. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's a big challenge, but I think it's coming. Uh, I hope in the next five, ten years, some people would dump uh, a good amount of investment, saying that you know this US DOT is going to put so many million, millions of dollars doing uh, large large language models for state DOT. You just digest, you just learn uh, days and months and years. And hopefully at the end, when the training is finished, uh, that particular AI is going to answer so many questions for the director, the uh, engineering offices and design people, field engineers, everybody. So it is coming. The next question for you is if the transversal resolution at highway speed is one millimeter, how much more beneficial or accurate is it to use a deep learning method to upsample versus creating a Poisson mesh using the existing data and sampling from that mesh at 0 0.1 millimeters in all directions? Did you explore that? Uh, right, This, uh, if I understood this question correctly, uh, uh, it's very similar to uh, what we uh, tested uh, essentially to upsample uh, uh, the the image in one direction, not two directions. So we have an advantage versus what Google and Microsoft are doing. Essentially, they are trying to uh, upsample from a 2D uh, color image or photo. Uh, we're running about one direction. I agree with you that uh, we should be able to upsample the existing one millimeter data to be ten times better, right? And uh, we can do that. Uh, uh, technically speaking, uh, the biggest challenge, uh, guys, uh, we have, uh, you know, so many people in the audience. Uh, I, I assume some of you uh, probably have uh, some authorities on funding and everything else. Uh, transportation industry in general is poorly funded uh, in the research area. Uh, the 99% of the big money in the transportation came from autonomous driving people, and, and each of them spend like a billion dollar or $10 billion a year in the last 10 years. Uh, so we need a lot of funding uh, to do this. Uh, you know, For those people who do university-based research, either you give money to universities or university faculty members to receive money, any projects at a scale of a million dollars is a huge project, right? But for example, if you fund somebody a million dollar a year for five years, to do large language model for transportation, 
uh, we, we, we're short about 10 times. We need uh, $10 million a year. Uh, so, uh, so it's a very, very difficult problem uh, compared to what the scale of funding we had in the past, okay? So uh, I'm not sure a private industry has the motivation to do that. Um, I'm not sure about that, uh, but it takes a lot of money. It takes about maybe a hundred people working for five years, 10 years on full-time basis. So uh, thank you for, for the question. Your next question is, uh, could this be used for information on crack depth and could the deep learning account for aggregate types? Uh, crack, uh, crack, depth, uh, crack depth is interesting. It was uh, frequently asked. Uh, crack depth information is uh, impractical in many ways because the, the vast amount of information or crack depth is, is not visible. Okay, if you look at a crack, at which, which can be very wide, if you visually can see that, our laser system can get that depth. Okay, not, no problem there. But from the materials and also design perspective, uh, they need to know the full crack depth. Uh, that's way beyond visual. So we don't know. <laughs> so uh, it is not possible to do uh, uh, the determination of crack depth. Uh, aggregate tap, uh, types, or uh, yes, yeah, yeah aggregate uh, types, uh, many of them can be observed visually uh, on the surface. Yes, our technology can do that. The next one is where was the data collected and what time of year? Uh, it depends on what you're talking about. If you're talking about payment management, PMS needs for a 3D payment service data collection with complete coverage, complete land coverage, that's normally done once a year by state DOT, okay? Regarding safety uh, data collection, I it can be several times a year, uh, set, like uh, Laura, uh, her expertise, her reputation is in winter maintenance, right? And then that can be several times in the winter time. Uh, uh, Laura actually is working on some interesting uh, endeavors as how to mount the sensors into transit buses. So they have uh, hourly uh, data uh, around the year. <laughs> uh, that's something that uh, you know WTI is working on uh, to obtain funding to do that. And that would be a fascinating approach. So, uh, and the other thing is you guys uh, should be aware that uh, all the new vehicles produced today in the last two or three years, uh, all of them have sensors, many sensors. Uh, Volkswagen has dozens of sensors. Uh, they actually can transmit the sensor data in real time to the cloud today. All the vehicles pre produced last couple of years, which means uh, in the next five years, uh, there will be real time sensor data coming to the cloud, probably in the amount of terabytes per second from all the automakers, you know, uh, produced vehicles. So, uh, so it's an interesting time, guys. Uh, now, these data sets uh, do not come from autonomous vehicles or uh, battery-based vehicles or, or gas-based vehicles have sensors today, lots of them. Uh, they can be transmitted to the cloud. So, so lots of these sensor data contain uh, friction information, braking information, uh, payment condition information. Uh, so this is another angle uh, that you guys need to uh, uh, pay attention to. It, it, it is coming. We have two more questions and then I'll bring up the final slides to go ahead and wrap up our webinar. Our last two questions for you are, have the deep learning models included macro texture of the pavement surface that is related to pavement friction? Uh, the deep learning model uh, does not address micro texture or macro texture directly. It, it essentially addresses an issue of increasing uh, the resolution of the data in the longitudinal direction so that we have a digital trend of the payment surface at 0.1 millimeter resolution. When that data set is reconstructed, then we have both macro and micro data on the, on the digital trend and then we can do analysis from there. 
And the last question we have is, can Wavelet's DWT transformation of 2D images be used to create a comparative model? Uh, I am not sure uh, about this question. Uh, if you, because we are producing a 3D train at the 0.1 millimeter, we essentially have all the data, all the information of the pavement surface. Uh, you know, that's visually phase four. So I, since I did not understand the question completely, what I can say, the answer probably is yes. <laughs> No problem. And if uh, the person who asked that question, if you have uh, follow ups for that, I did put Kelvin's email, uh, Laura's email, as well as the email address for the National Center for Rural Road Safety in the chat pod. So you guys can feel free to follow up on any questions that we weren't able to answer um, yet. So Dana, if you could um, provide me with sharing privileges, I'll pull up our very last slide and get us all closed out. Well, thank you guys. So once again, I do wanna thank our presenters, uh, Laura Fay and Kelvin Wang. Thank you so much for coming today and presenting on pavement friction for safety. Um, and then just for everyone else still joining us, I wanted to remind you that we are doing our Road Safety Champion Program trainings right now. They are occurring on Tuesdays from 11 to 1 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, those are happening as you can see here through, from January 30th through March 12th, and you can sign up for those on the Safety Center's registration site on our page, ruralsafetycenter.org. We would love to see you all there. Um, and that's it. We thank you for joining us today for our January webinar. Again, you will have um, a, a survey coming at you. Please feel free to give us your input on today's webinar as well as topics and presenters that you'd like to see in the future. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, and I'm sorry, the presentation, the upload is not there yet. Um, so we will be sending that out by email. So we will um, get Kelvin's presentation out to everyone who um, who attended today. Thank you.